What is the nature of faith, and how should that work out in our daily lives as Christians? Hi, I'm Michael Kosky, pastor of New Covenant Baptist Church in Mesquite, Texas, and today we're going to start an expositional sermon series on the book of 2 Peter, and we'll answer those questions in this sermon. If you haven't already, go ahead and like, share, and subscribe down below, and also hit that notification bell so you never miss one of our videos. Join us today, and I hope that you'll be blessed. We'll be in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Today I want to begin a nine-week series of expository messages from the epistle of Second Peter. By the time the series is over, we will have gone line by line through the entire book. Now, expository preaching isn't something that's practiced as much nowadays, but it has at least one key advantage. It forces us to focus on the text as it is written. And if done correctly, it doesn't allow us to go off into the weeds of what we think is most important. If the Bible is the Word of God, and it is, then we can rightfully expect that every line of Scripture is there because God wanted it to be there. Every word that proceeded from God to the biblical authors was revealed and written for a reason. There are no such things as throwaway sentences in the Bible. Those very truths will become clear as we study 2 Peter as a significant portion of the letter is about the nature of Scripture. But even more fundamental than that, Peter's letter is about the transformed life that takes place in every true believer in Jesus. So that is my primary aim in these messages, to allow 2 Peter to stir our hearts and minds for Christ so that we might be transformed. And just a quick side note, if you're normally not one to follow along in your Bible, you might want to start doing that for this series, as that will make it much easier for you to understand what I'm referring to as I talk through each verse. So let's start in the first part of verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. In the first line of the letter, the author identifies himself as Simon Peter. But, believe it or not, it, the authorship of 2 Peter has been controversial among many biblical scholars for centuries. Some have believed that because the language and style of 2 Peter is noticeably different from that of 1 Peter, one of the two letters must not have been written by Peter himself. But just as many scholars have noted that 1 Peter and 2 Peter look different because each letter is addressing completely different issues. And besides that, there is no convincing biblical or historical reason why we shouldn't think that Simon Peter wrote this letter. Therefore, I believe that we should take what's written in the first line at face value namely that Peter is indeed the author. So in the very first line, Peter introduces himself as a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. And it's here that we get a sense of Peter's character. Now we're accustomed to think of Peter as always being the brash and bold fisherman that we met in the Gospels. But after years of being a leader of the church and experiencing the hardship and the victory that came with that, he is now older, wiser, and more humble as he writes this letter. He was an apostle, but he didn't list that credential first. 
the very first thing he says about himself is that he is a servant of Jesus Christ. And of course, you've heard before, that word can also mean bondservant or even slave. In other words, Peter is using his authority in the church to write this letter, yet acknowledging that any authority he has is derived from Christ. Peter has a limited authority in the church because Jesus has absolute authority over his life. But none of that is to take away from the fact that Peter is indeed an apostle of the church. One of the twelve who were commissioned to spread the gospel far and wide and to help care for and lead the flock of God's sheep. And it was acknowledged in the early church that the apostles spoke for Jesus. Therefore, when addressing the churches, their words were given just as much attention as the very words of Jesus himself. So after Peter introduces himself, he immediately dives into the content of the letter. Now let's look at the second part of verse 1. He says, To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours, by righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Peter gives us his audience, those who have obtained faith by the grace of Jesus Christ. We should not treat this as a throwaway line. Peter wants to quickly remind his readers of the truth that binds every believer together as one church in various locations, and that is the gospel of Jesus. And as we read further into 2 Peter, we'll see that a large portion of the letter is about Christian holiness or virtue in the midst of a confused and immoral world. But before Peter gets to that, he has to undergird that charge to holiness with the reminder that Jesus is the one who makes that holiness possible and even desirable. Now, Peter assumes that the faithful of his readers have already heard and believed in the gospel for their salvation, for the salvation of their souls. They presumably believe that Jesus was God, yet also man, that he lived a sinless life, that he died a sacrificial death on the cross, and that he was raised from the dead on the third day. That death on the cross met the righteous requirement of God the Father, whose wrath was stored up against every human being who ever lived because of Adam's sin. Jesus' death was a fitting sacrifice because only he could take that sin of humanity upon himself and thereby absorb the Father's wrath for our sin. So from that point forward, all those who would simply believe in the identity and sacrifice of Jesus would be redeemed from their sins, and would be assured of eternal salvation. It was God's grace and mercy, his righteousness, that made all of that possible. God does not save us because of anything good in us. He saves us because we put our faith, our trust in his Son who clothes us with his righteousness. And the only thing he requires of us is faith. But even that itself is a gift of God. Peter says that we have obtained faith. And the Greek word that's used for obtained means to obtain by lot, as in casting lots. In the ancient world, people would cast lots to make a decision. It was kind of like rolling dice. If the dice landed in your favor, it was understood that God was favoring you. And that favor was not based on your own merit. In other words, we don't obtain faith by our works, but by his grace. So Peter understands that if his readers believe in the gospel, then they will have the ability to grasp everything else that he has to say in his letter. But if they don't believe in the gospel then they are not born again and therefore not of equal standing with him and the rest of the church. But how does someone receive the gift of faith? Is it just something that we're born with? 
Or is it some kind of a vague impression or feeling that we get when we look inward at ourselves? Well, Peter answers that question in the second verse. He says, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. We receive faith with and with it the gift of salvation by knowing God. How do we know God? The Apostle Paul says in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. We receive knowledge of God from hearing the gospel and from hearing the proclamation of God's word. If we don't know the Bible very well, we are not going to know God very well. And if we don't know God very well, our faith, and along with that, grace and peace in our lives is not going to increase. But what specifically about God's Word do we need to know in order for our faith to increase? Well, we find our clue if we skip briefly down to verse 4. First part of verse 4 says, By which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises. We know and meditate on the promises of God that we find throughout Scripture. God uses that knowledge to bolster our faith and to help us to press on when life gets hard. Here's something you can start applying right away. Make it a habit to identify God's promises in your daily Bible reading and to meditate on those promises throughout the day. I know that there have been countless occasions when I've simply read the Bible out of a sense of duty rather than going to it expecting to hear from God and then taking from his word promises that will sustain my walk with him throughout the day. The more we know about God and his will for our lives, the more our faith will increase. That's why it's so important to make meditation on the word a central part of our lives. In Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, David says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the instruction of the Lord, and on his instruction he meditates day and night. When our lives are steeped in Scripture, we will delight in God, and our thoughts will be rooted in his will. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How rich would our daily lives be if God's word was on our minds all the time? So the Bible in general, and the Apostle Paul in particular, are very clear that faith is first and foremost a matter of knowledge of God. Without that, we become lost in our own opinions and feelings. That said, faith is incomplete if it simply remains in your head but never makes its way to your heart. We see the importance of that in the remaining verses of our passage today. Let's look again at verses 3 and 4. They say, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Now there's a lot to unpack in these verses, but the first thing to notice is that as believers, God has given us life-transforming power. And that power leads to the promise of eternal life with him into a godly life here and now. In other words, it gives us everything we really need. In verse 3, the word excellence is referring to moral excellence or righteousness. God has called us not only to save us and give us eternal life, but so that we would live lives of righteousness for his glory. But even as believers, we can't do that in our own power. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, I'm sure that you know that by now. 
No, we have to continually rely on the power of Christ, which works in us by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us that Jesus is not only the founder, but also the perfecter of our faith. That means that once you've been born again, Jesus doesn't just dust off his hands and say, my work is done here. No, instead he says, now the real work begins. If you believe in him, then Jesus is at work in your life daily by the power of the Spirit that dwells in you. Our growth in godliness is, going, is ongoing, and it will not be perfected until we see Christ face to face. So we're given the power to live godly, holy lives. But what is our motivation to do that? It's not salvation, because our salvation is a done deal once we've placed our trust in Him. As I talked about in the previous sermon series, our motivations themselves begin to change once we become born again. Our desires become reoriented. We see our clue for that truth at the end of verse 4. It says, we have escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. All outward acts of immorality are the result of misplaced desires. We see that truth acknowledged in James, uh, James 1, verse 15. Desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. If sinful desire is what has caused corruption in the world, then God-oriented desires are what allow us to escape the tendencies of our corrupt world and enjoy abundant life. Oftentimes when we think of grace, we think of God's salvation of sinners, giving them eternal life with him. But what does grace do for us in the here and now? It transforms our hearts. And with a transformed heart comes transformed desires, desires that have their focus on the things of God. In John Piper's short biography on St. Augustine, he summarizes Augustine's understanding of grace, saying this, Grace is God's giving us sovereign joy in God that triumphs over joy in sin. Sovereign joy in God that triumphs over joy in sin. I think that's a wonderful definition of grace that highlights how God gives us the power to delight in Him and to no longer delight in sin. Delight in God leads to everlasting life. Delight in sin leads to everlasting torment. So those godly desires lead to a life of good works. The problem with those believers who only have a head knowledge about God, but have not yet allowed their affections to be stirred by Christ, is that they don't act on what they know to be true. And if they do act on it, they do those things begrudgingly, and eventually burn themselves out by trying hard to be good people. But James 1, verses 22 through 25 says this, Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away, and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the word of God, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. He will be blessed in his doing. So let's not be hearers only of God's word. Instead, let's listen intently to the words of Peter and commit to living in the power of God, allowing our heads and our hearts to produce fruit that glorifies our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to preach your word. Lord, I pray that this word would touch hearts and minds, that it would bring about not just information, but transformation, Lord. Guide us, Lord. Continue to transform our hearts throughout this coming week. 
Help us to place our thoughts and our affections on you. We pray for reoriented desires, Lord, that would love you more than anything else in this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Hey, everyone. Thanks again for watching. I hope that you were blessed by today's message. Go ahead and join us next week for our second installment in our series on 2 Peter. And if you haven't already, go ahead and like, share, and subscribe down below. And also hit that notification bell so you never miss one of our videos. And you can check out our other videos on this channel. Have a great week, and God bless.